From whereabouts in Virginia do you live? Lexington. Where is that? About 300 miles south of uh, Washington. I uh, live there for three reasons. One, I was born near there many, many years ago. And two, I have seen a fair piece of the world, but I don't know any fairer piece than the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. And three, Lexington is home of VMI and Washington and Lee, so I have these grand research resources there. Yeah, well, I noticed you set uh, a good part of Spangled in, the, in uh, Virginia, and one of your heroes keeps talking about uh, going to VMI to teach. You've actually read the thing? Well, I haven't finished it. Uh, if you would have written it a little shorter, I might have. But uh, yes, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying the book. It's. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have got typecast now as a writer of doorstop-sized novels, and my publishers just won't let me do anything smaller nowadays. Well, let's. I want to talk about uh, Spangle uh, more specifically in a, uh, in a moment, but I'd, first I'd like to uh, talk about you and find out how all this began. You, you were born near at Lexington? Very near there. Near, little, near Lexington? In, in the country. Uh, well, what year were you born? 1928, back shortly before the flood. That was a very, very good year, especially <laughs> for you. You came into the world. What, uh, what did your parents do? My father was a printer, and at the age of 12, I was his printer's devil, hand-setting type and a job stick. So I've been sort of associated with words all my life. Later on, in my teens, I went into advertising, got interrupted there by being drafted for the Korean War. Uh, the Army made me a war correspondent, gave me a jeep and a carbine and a portable typewriter and sort of said, go be Bill Malden. So uh, I saw the whole Korean War from the front lines to the prisoner of war camps down south. and. Uh, when I came back, I went into advertising, but some of my Korean stuff had got picked up by the wire services, and I'd been bylined over here, so I was able to get an agent. And I wrote, in my spare time, I wrote short stories and articles, and quite a few of them got published. And uh, eventually, as everybody does, I began to loathe advertising. And uh, one day just said, the hell with it, if I'm ever going to uh, make a move as a freelance, now's the time, and I just walked out of advertising and, and starved for a good many years. But uh, Did you go to VMI? No. I, uh, my only education was in art school because I originally went into advertising as a commercial artist. Oh. But I discovered two things. One was that I had more facility than talent, and the other was that the copy department got paid a damn sight better than the art department did. So I was gradually weaseled my way over into the copy department. Where in advertising did you work? Oh, I've been with most of the Madison Avenue agencies. You know how it is. 18 months in one, two years in another. I was with Kleppner, BBDO, several you probably never heard of. So you spent a good uh, many years here in New York City, huh? Oh, yes, 20 or thereabouts, in total, with interruptions. For... But it was a cultural clash. You kept yearning for that pretty country in Virginia. Oh, no, never yearning, really. Uh, when I left New York the last time, for good, that is. I went to Mexico and spent 12 years down there writing, uh, researching, and then writing my first doorstop novel, Aztec, and that was my breakthrough. Up until then, I'd been earning a subsistence living. Aztec made me at least solvent. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I sure did. Well, let's go back and, and uh, tell me about uh, about your, your first uh, uh, work of fiction, which was not, uh, as you say, a doorstop uh, novel. That was The Journeyer? Oh, no. No, no, no. It no, wasn't. no. Aztec was your first book, wasn't it? No, it was not. Uh, I don't have everything on the card there. Oh, well, tell me about those that don't appear on the card. <laughs> oh, I did a dozen or so juvenile, adult, that is, fiction and non-fiction. And I've done uh, a uh, sort of philology for the layman f uh, for adults. And uh, that was recently republished as World of Words. Um... And then I did a couple of short novels, which uh, made more money actually on Hollywood options than they ever did as books. They have yet to come to the screen, but uh, people keep still picking them up at various studios out yonder. And uh, and I've done tons of magazine work for National Geographic, Reader's Digest, um, and a lot of short stories. And. Uh, but when I started on Aztec, I knew that that was going to be my breakthrough because it was a novel that nobody had ever done before. There have been novels about the Aztecs, but they mainly 
consisted of the conquest, the clash of cultures. Why, uh, why did you become interested in the Aztecs? Well, I was living among them for one thing. <laughs> well, were you de there to, to live? I mean, you didn't go to Mexico just to, to research Aztec. No, that notion came to me after I got there. I went down there because uh, on a freelance writer's income, you can live pretty well in Mexico, far better than you can in New York. And uh, uh, while I was there, I uh, simply noticed that there were very few novels on the Aztecs, and they all mainly dealt with the conquest, and I decided to go back 40, 50, 60 years before the Aztecs had ever known that there was such a thing as a white man and tell something about what they were like in their at the height of their civilization. Yeah, that really was a breakthrough novel for you. And I understand you even uh, learned the Aztec language? It's called Nahuatl. Yes, I did. That's not still being spoken, though, is it? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Uh, I managed to get along adequately among the Nahuatl speakers, but there are some 60 different pre-Columbian languages still spoken in Mexico. I don't know exact how exact the demogra demographic figures are, but... Somebody has calculated that something like 65% of Mexicans do not yet speak Spanish. And so in some of these out-of-the-way boondock places where I went to do my research, uh, I would have to have an, a Spanish interpreter along to just be able to communicate. Among the Nahuatl speakers, I got along all right, but when you get down and put places with strange languages like Tzotzil and Chamula and things like that... Uh, I had to have somebody along. Uh, how long did you spend researching Aztec? Twelve years. Twelve years. Well, it need not have taken so long, but uh, as I say, I was living marginally as a freelance writer, so I had to uh, do a lot of hack work in the meantime just for subsistence. And uh, in the, whenever I wanted to take a journey, say, into the desert or down to the jungles or whatever, I'd sort of have to save up my money until I could afford to go. And... Uh, I was supported by no funds, grants, endowments, anything like that. I was doing it purely on my own. And uh, finally the time came when I had a ton of notes and tapes and photographs and things and thought, now or never. So I called my agent in New York and said, can you get me an advance that will allow me for one, maybe two years, just to put myself 500 years back in the past into a culture that is as alien to ours as the Martian would be and not be interrupted by any deadlines, commissions, hack work, uh, journeys for the National Geographic, whatever. And uh, fortunately, she was able to sell the thing on the basis of an outline. And uh, I got, well, you know how chintzy publishers are. They sort of said, <laughs> we, we'll give you $5,000 every time you come up with 250 acceptable pages sort of thing. But by the time I was halfway through it, they knew what they had, and we renegotiated the contract, and from then on it's been easy street, more or less. Doesn't uh, a novelist take a risk in, in blending uh, fact and fiction in the, the way that you did in Aztec? It's, uh, well, it's not a risk. It's rather difficult. I've got all kinds of letters from people saying how much of this is fact and how much is fiction. Well, I created fictional characters, but there are factual ones in there as well, and uh, and I adhered closely to every fact that was available. Whenever there's an eclipse in there or a comet appears in the sky, you can damn well bet that I know it appeared on that date. And uh, uh, all the other details of the religious ceremonies and things, sacrifices and whatnot, uh, I researched most thoroughly, and uh, they're not still holding human sacrifices in New York, but at New York, good God, in Mexico. Well, sometimes they do. <laughs> <laughs> All the wonderful days of those were the days of the human sacrifices. Uh, but uh, they do uh, still sacrifice piglets and lambs and roosters and that sort of thing to the various old gods. Catholicism down there is a very thin veneer over the old religions, I can tell you. Well, let's uh, uh, bring uh, the story up to date with, with Spangle. You must have had... Uh, some great interest in the, the circus. What gave you the idea for Spangle? Well, once again, it was one of those books nobody's ever really done. When, uh, if you think of, you know, think of a circus novel. What do you think of? Toby Tyler's Ten Weeks, six week, Ten weeks of the Circus. Yeah. And that was written in something like 1898. And it was a children's book. And 
those were Victorian times, very pussy-footy, and uh, so they hardly gave a true picture of the circus, and I thought I'd try. And uh, all well, the circus people... How, how did you go about researching this? There must be a lot of information. You probably went down to uh, what, Sir, Sarasota? No, I... Uh, they have a museum down there, Circus Museum? The big Circus Museum is up in Baraboo, Wisconsin. Oh. Um, Sarasota's the winter quarters for quite a number of circuses. Um, now, the first thing I needed was a real mud show, because my circus starts out as a raggle-taggle, uh, raggedy-ass uh, bunch of nothings, and... Uh, Fortunately, I was able to find a real mud show. It was just starting up its first season, and it was it was pathetic enough to serve my purposes. You know, they didn't carry their own crew of roustabouts. And whatever town they came to, they'd just scour the streets for the town drunks and hire them to put up the canvas. And Wait a minute, are you saying you joined the circus? Oh, I traveled with nine of them altogether. You traveled with nine circuses? Two here in the States and seven in Europe and Russia. Oh, yes, I spent a whole year with the circus. What name do they give you? What, <laughs> what uniform? <laughs> oh, I don't mean I did anything. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, well, shoveled, I shoveled a lot of elephant manure. Of course, in Spangle, anybody who joins the circus is given a new name and a uh, <laughs> uniform and uh, shown how to do something. <laughs> no, that was just another rube as far as they were concerned. But they were most hospitable, warm. They're the friendliest people on earth. And they let me participate in so far as, uh, well, you know, practically anything I asked to do, they'd let me do. I've been in the cage with the cats during the uh, wild animal acts, and just as a supernumerary standing around with a whip looking silly. But uh, I've served as the target for a knife thrower in the sideshow. A friendly uh, knife thrower, I hope? Hey, well, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, um, what else? Uh, um, well, let uh, me ask you, the, the circus in the 19th century that you describe in Spangle, isn't that a lot different from the circuses that you toured with? It is, of course. And uh, I had to do a great deal of historical research on that in that respect. <coughs> Excuse me. I remember once in Italy I was having dinner with some with a trapeze family, and they were saying something like, well, you know, our act wouldn't have been much different a hundred years ago, and I had to correct them. I said, the hell it wouldn't. Uh, <clears throat> back in a hundred years ago, Leotard had first done the leap from one trapeze to another. Before that, it had been just acrobatics on one hanging trapeze. He was the first one to do a leap, and now you're doing triple and quadruple somersaults between them. And he would not have had all this chromium plating that you've got and the strobe lights and the glitzy amplified music and so forth. And the, and the artiste said, Perbacco, you're right. I never thought of that. So, uh, uh, well, I was surprised. You mentioned leotard. Uh, here they're wearing leotards in, in Spangle. Here's the 19th century. And uh, I guess I hadn't thought very much about it. But I, uh, as I think about acrobats in the 19th century and you think of the... Puritan uh, approach that they had toward life, you wonder about that. But apparently in the circus, they were pretty uh, open about it, huh? Well, it, uh, on the same theory that uh, acting was considered just one cut above street walking, you know, all the lady actresses took names like Mrs. Sidden and Mrs. Campbell and so forth to give them an aura of respectability. Circus folk were considered uh, just about a cut above gypsy tinsmiths coming through town and stealing chickens and things. Uh, so they were allowed to get away with a bit of uh, raunch, you might say. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you have so many facts, like the, I can't remember the name of it, but the little uh, piece of uh, material that the, oh, uh, the cash, acrobats wear between, cash their, sex, yes. between their legs, uh, both the male and the, the female. And, uh, uh, and uh, you have so many facts about, well, I think there's a, you go into detail about how a six-shooter works, and on and on and on and on. Uh, so how do, where did you get all of the, this information? Well, when I decided to have a Confederate officer join the uh, circus as a shootist, uh, I began to wonder, how sharply can you shoot with those old weapons? And so I went out and bought some. I got me an 1857 Remington cap and ball revolver, the same as he uses, and a cook carbine. And uh, got the gunsmith to show me how to load these things and went out and practiced with them. Turns out you can shoot pretty damn sharp with those things. 
I really do go into my research rather well, you deeply. You really immersed yourself in that, didn't you? <laughs> well, how long uh, in researching did you do? That's a little hard to say because I first thought of doing a circus novel sometime back in the 60s when it looked like the circus was disappearing forever. And I was sort of thinking of doing a monument to a vanished institution. So it was back then that I began collecting everything I could find on circuses. But uh, I spent a year of legwork uh, everywhere from Nashville to Leningrad. And, uh, and then another, what, two years at the typewriter, I suppose. Um, well, you didn't, uh, all of the research you did, you didn't leave anything out. You put it all in Spangle, didn't you? Oh, <laughs> Lord, no. If I'd put it all in, it would be six times that thick. I, I do try to prune wherever I can, but uh, um, when people get interested in a subject and somebody picking up a book on the circus is presumably interested in the circus, I try to tell them the interesting things that they might like to know. I mean, there are all kinds of oh, myriad details that I've left out that simply did not lend themselves to entertainment value or instruction value or edification, whatever you want to call it. But Was there a precedent for a, a circus being caught behind uh, the lines? Oh, the yes, many of them, world? yes. Um, a lot of them uh, got out and went off to South America or over to England or whatever. But, uh, yes, there were quite a few. Uh, some of them took to showboats on the river, on the northern rivers. Uh, yes, that wasn't entirely invented. I, uh, as I say, I hewed a history in so far as I can. Now, Florian, where, where it doesn't interfere with my story. <laughs> <laughs> Florian, now he, uh, he's kind of like a prototype of P.T. Barnum, isn't he? Oh, please, I hope no, not. No, uh, everybody. Because I don't know that much about Barnum, but uh, <laughs> just by no. by the name, it just strikes me as no, the arch typical uh, uh, circus you, you, chief. You think of any any circus movie or play, that, or or television show that you've ever seen, and it's automatically patterned on P.T. Barnum, bombast and uh, uh, sucker born every minute, that sort of thing. And uh, I tried to make Florian a bit more, a bit less of a caricature. Um, you probably don't know this, but Barnum never even got into the circus business until he was 65 years old. He had made all his uh, reputation and fortune with his Barnum's Museum down here on Broadway. And he had some traveling menageries going around the country, but it wasn't until Jim Bailey, who was a circus owner, came to him and said, if you'll just lend me your name, it'll, you know, be great for the circus. You'll be a silent partner. And of course, Barnum didn't stay silent very long. He, he pitched into it with great enthusiasm. But he was only in the circus business for about five years until he died. And um, I have tried to give Florian a bit more dimension than most circus proprietors are given in in the movies where they're always played by Guy Kibbe or Edward Arnold, you know. Uh, now, Gary uh, Jennings, you have uh, all this research. You spent uh, uh, about a year on the road with nine circuses, and uh, you traveled a lot, developed all this uh, material, and it's it stacked up in your office or your room or wherever you were. Uh, how then did you decide, how did you go ahead and uh, create the story, decide what kind of plot you would use and integrate this material as well. I guess what I'm asking is to tell me a little bit about the creative process involved in Spangle. The creative process is simply that I, I, I know how it's going to begin and I know how it's going to end. And then I spend all this time at the typewriter forcing those two first and last pages apart. Uh, in this case, I did probably the weirdest ever outline that's ever been done for a novel. I took a sheet of brown wrapping paper about four feet wide and 20 feet long and divided it vertically by locales and dates uh, as the circus progresses through these six years of the novel and then divided it horizontally according to the various characters, the fictional ones and the real ones like the Empress Elizabeth and, and uh, Emperor Louis Napoleon and so forth. And on the vertical lines, and I put what was actually happening at that time, at that place, uh, in the world of politics, because the European frontiers were all changing at the time, and there were wars and revolutions going on. And then the horizontal lines of my characters, I 
trace their development from, say, apprentice trapeze artists to accomplished trapeze artists. And, uh, and then with little diagonal and curly Q lines, I trace their interrelationships and erotic entanglements and jealousies and rivalries and so forth. And this thing, the paper was 20 feet long. Uh, when I finally had this outline completed, it ran from this edge over here, 1865 at Appomattox, where the book begins, all the way down and around this, that side of the paper and all the way down the other. I had a 40-foot bayou tapestry, <laughs> uh, and it looked like the timetable and uh, track layout of every railroad in creation. No, no other human being except myself could have made sense out of this mess. But uh, it was something you could not do on computers or word processors because I had this overview of everything that was happening and I could spot everything in time and place and know who had just died and who was about to die down yonder and, and uh, what else can I say? Wow, that's, uh, that's really a creative accomplishment to, to do something like that. And I've never been able to figure out how people... Well, I hope, I'll never, I hope I'll never have to do that again. But. Uh, well, of course you will. <laughs> you, you're going to be itching at it in about two years, three years, to start a new project if you haven't already. But uh, when, you, when you sit down and write in such a long book, uh, and it's a, such a solitary existence... Uh, is is there any point that uh, it becomes tedious that you just have to get up and, and run away from this? Oh yes, yes, yes. I'll go out and garden. I'll play with my pet timber wolf. Uh, most people keep dogs. I keep a timber wolf. Um, Toothless? No, no, not at all. Friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Amenable. Put it that way. Uh, hell, I'll get up and wash dishes just to get away from the typewriter. Sometimes. Yes, there are spots where there. Are chunks of history that have to go in and you have to labor over them to make them interesting and not just a dead spot in the narrative. But in general, uh, I have a great deal of fun. I, I put a lot of myself into just about every character in the book and I've often told lecture audiences, writing classes and things that heroes are generally deadly dull and boring and hard as hell to write. Um, you know, virtue and nobility are uh, not at all interesting. It's the scamps and the rogues who are interesting. And so uh, I may have trouble making my heroes believable, but for the villains and the buffoons, I have known so many in my life that I simply take them from real life and put them in. <clears throat> are you a rewriter? Oh, Lord, every, every paragraph is rewritten at least 18 times before it goes into first draft. I don't uh, start, I don't write a whole draft and then go back and, you know, page one to page 1800 or whatever. Um, everything is rewritten and rewritten and rewritten before I even consider it first draft. And then I go back and mainly what I have to do then is cut and uh, do some bridging here and there. And uh, uh, I, would, I would say easily every line in that book has been written 18 times. Is it hard to remember uh, what you've done, uh, where you have, where you need to make certain changes, and where certain things happen? In this book, with this vast cast of characters and uh, the vast locale it covers, uh, yes. But having that Bayou Tapestry of mine, it was pretty easy for me to pinpoint places where, you know, if I'd forgotten somebody's name, I could go run back along this piece of paper and find it. That happened quite often. You well, know, that's right? an advantage of a word processor. If you want to look up a name, uh, you can just oh, go it to is. find it. It is, find yes, yes, but uh, uh, a word processor can't give you that long overview that I oh. had. Uh, How many manuscript pages did you wind up with? Yeah, about 1,800. And uh, then what happened? It went off to the uh, the publishing house. Do you then work with an editor? Does that, is it further refined? They... Uh, my editors generally, uh, I've been in my trade long enough, and I have been an editor. Um, they generally trust me to do my own editing. They may have queries here and there, but uh, they don't press me too hard for changes. They don't say, you know, this character is absolutely vile, take it out, anything like that. Um, they, they, they'll quibble here and there, you know. Uh, how, could, how could this be true when this was true? You know, they, they do catch me up on certain... Uh, slip-ups of old time, locale, that sort of thing. They don't use a fact-checker, do they? 
Oh, yes, it goes to a copy editor who must be... I don't know the lady. I've never met her. But how could she uh, possibly know all of them? You have so many facts in here that she couldn't possibly know about them. No, she no, but she would question things like, uh, uh, for example, the uh, Oxford English Dictionary uh, has no uh, notion of where the word gimmick came from. I did. Uh, in my going back through these ancient, ancient circus my memoirs of circus people and so forth. It was originally gimmicks, G-I-M-M-I-X, and it meant any kind of tool or or uh, prop or uh, uh, some some gimmick used in an act. And uh, <coughs> I imagine it probably came from the Romany because there were so many gypsies in the circus trade. But, uh, you know, uh, the copy editor would question this, you know, Oxford English Dictionary gives no source for gimmicks. And uh, and then, then she would say things like, uh, you have this girl 17 at this point of the book, and you had her 12 over here, and only uh, four years have elapsed, so I'd have to go back and make a 13 back here. I forget little things like that. But... Uh, uh, yeah, she she checks. That's good. She That's checks good. spelling she and. Catch that, yeah. Oh yes, yes, yes. She did. Uh, uh, she's very valuable, and uh, I had only one quibble with her. She insists on changing some of my spellings, which I resist. I insist that any more is two words, and she insists that it's one word. So we have a squabble over that every time I do a book, and she edits it. But it, I get my way. It comes out as two words. I'm, I'm not sure. <clears throat> I'm not even sure which way I spell it. <laughs> I don't think I've even thought about it before. It's, it's interesting. Well, that's a really a remarkable uh, accomplishment, uh, Smangle is. And one thing I think uh, uh, the the fact, you know, most people would not go to read historical text about the circus or the Civil War or anything else. Uh, most people like the drama of a novel, of a fiction, or a film. Mm -hmm to tell them what goes on, and they learn so much. So this is a wonderful way, isn't it, of, of learning history, isn't it? I hope so. I try to uh, I try to tell people things that I don't think they knew before uh, and tell it in a way that uh, they can absorb without, uh, well, painlessly. But uh, also I do these books for my own pleasure. Um, when I was in Mexico, I was being Walter Houston in The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, you know, and uh, then uh, for my next book, The Journeyer, I just decided to do everything that any red-blooded American boy would do, love to do. For The Journeyer, I followed Marco Polo from Venice to Cathay to Java, retraced his whole trip. And this time I ran away with the circus, just like any red-blooded American boy. Where are you going next? Next I'm doing the Ostrogoths in about 500 A.D., the time of Theodoric the Great. This uh, spring, I was I was in the Balkans, starting my legwork for this thing. I was already pretty familiar with most of the country that the Goths rampaged over. Russia, Hungary, Bavaria, Austria, Italy. But I'd never been to the Black Sea, so I made a special trip just to go and see the Black Sea, which is where they erupted from when they rampaged across Europe. And uh, it was a useful trip. I came back with everything I needed, but... Uh, not to offend anybody in your audience, if you're ever planning a second honeymoon, I wouldn't go to Bulgaria. <laughs> no, that doesn't. No. Uh, besides that, in the honeymoon suite, I'm sure the room is bugged. <laughs> I'm sure the commissars get a kick out of all the noise in the honeymoon suite. But, uh, well, that's unfamiliar territory. I'll be uh, interested to see how that comes out. Well, that's another one, you see. Uh, everybody... I'd seen the Aztecs as bloodthirsty, red-handed savages, and I tried to show that they were human beings. The Ostrogoths go, have, are, have gone down in history as barbarians. Their side of the story has never been told. The, it's the victors who write history, and in this case it was Christianity that was the victors over the Ostrogoths, and so their, their story's been pretty much untold, and so that's what I'm going to do. You're going to make it shorter now, aren't you? Just uh, for us book critics. Uh, I do hope I can, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'd say about 196 pages would be uh, <laughs> fine. I'd get through that in maybe an evening and uh, yeah. 
That would be very helpful uh, for people like us who do oh. about uh, five or six books uh, a week. Oh, come on, Don. Uh, <laughs> the one thing you can say is that I give my readers at least poundage for their money. Oh, that's, uh, they're gonna, <laughs> the readers are going to love uh, uh, Spangle. You're really a storyteller, Gary Jennings.